In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. St. Michael the Archangel, defend, defend us in battle. Be our defense, defense against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God, God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, O Prince of the Heavenly Host, by the power of God, cast into hell Satan and all the other evil spirits who prowl about the world, seeking the ruin of souls. Amen. Amen. Today we have on the agenda Bishop Barron's presentation at the USCCB meeting. Now he had five points in his presentation, and the presentation was on how to reach out to millennial Catholics who have left the Catholic Church, how to bring them back into the Catholic Church. And it, the, the presentation was kind of weird at certain points because I was just wondering, is he also talking about like millennials who have never been to a Catholic Church before? But that's that's you know we'll probably get into that later. Um, so let's start off with his first point. The first point he said was how to bring young people into the church was get them involved with a path of justice and possibly even lead with social justice. Mm -hmm. Now, so Ryan, what do you think about that? Well, one, one thing is before he even began to mention those five paths of bringing people back to the church or getting them into the church if they've never been there is he just threw out these statistics. And I wanted to bring these up so that it's there on the record for the viewers. Um, he made mention that 24% of youth, um, I believe it was of youth, are unaffiliated. That means they don't belong to any church or go to mass or any of that stuff. 50% um, of all Catholics end up leaving the church, okay, which is terrible. That number is just astronomical. Yeah. And in the video that he showed, okay, he showed a video during his presentation to the bishops and they were talking to some youths and um, the main thing it was summarized that the, a few of the kids said they left because they never understood what was going on at, at, in church at mass um, one fellow said well science kind of took over the explanation and I have uh, oh I believe now in more logical uh, things and, and not so much of what uh, the church tells me and uh, that God is the cause of all this. And then there was a, a, a young woman who said, well, I don't feel any different after I attend Mass. 80% um, of leavers leave before the age of 23, which means that pretty much everybody who's leaving is a young person. Uh, and then he summarized this, that these, these uh, youth are... They're poorly formed, they're not getting any answers from the church, and they have this, um, you know, there's a negative influence from the world. These are my remarks here about this initially when I was watching these kids talking. Um, it, there's very interesting topics here. Why? Why do they never understand, why have they not understood what the church teaches or what the faith is? Is this... Uh, explanation that science has all the explanations is that true and is it logical to say that there's no God and um, and what do we say about you know what do we say about feelings should you feel is mass about having a good feeling is prayer about having a good feeling is morality about having a good feeling these are all things that we need to get at and uh, I think the bottom line is that not only are these are the youth poorly formed in terms of Catholicism, but they're poorly formed as human beings, okay? If you think that the ultimate metric of whether something's good or bad is how does it make you feel, then you are on the wrong path and you're on the path of perdition. You'll never be successful in life if your metric of what it, with my morality is how does it make me feel. Because guess what? We're getting up out of bed. Oh, that makes me feel bad. I'd rather stay in bed all day. Eating healthy? Who wants to do that? Go to work? Pfft. I'm voting for Bernie Sanders. He'll give me everything free, okay? So, um, catechesis is to blame here for why they never understood. Uh, this business about science is totally ridiculous. Um, there's That's kind of the typical college atheist. It is. They get this stuff. There's no explanation of science that is less far-fetched, 
than some answer that you would get from the Bible or from St. Thomas Aquinas or some other father of the church. Um, it's the, it's the scientific explanations are nonsense. They actually require more faith than belief in God does. Um, and then feeling different. But anyway, so, sorry for that digression. Baron asked, how do we get these young people back? And the, he talked about five paths. The first of those, as you mentioned, was uh, the path of justice. So later on in the talk, he says that this could be understood as one of the transcendentals is the good. So you introduce the good to the youth. The youth subconsciously or by nature attaches and loves the good because we all love the good. And so that is a way to evangelize the youth. So he suggests that we walk the path of justice, get young people involved with soup kitchens, helping the poor, volunteering, saving the environment. He made mention of the youth reject the church's teaching on sexuality, but they do like the church's teaching on social justice. So Barron suggests that we, we, we have this tremendous tradition from Pope Leo XIII all the way up to Pope Francis, and so we lead with that. We get the young people active. Barron also, this was a very good remark he made, um, he said that there's actually a correlation between social justice, the, the church's teaching on, on social matters, and a direct connection with sexual morality. And that was pointed out by one of his predecessors, who was the rector of the Mundelein Seminary many years ago. Um, frankly, though, I don't understand the... I, I'm, I see a conflict here between what young people say they believe and what they actually then put into practice. Um, because they say, the youth say that they're interested in justice, but do they, do they really believe that and put it into practice? Um, and the, the reason why I bring this up is when, okay, so they're talking about, well, we don't believe what the church teaches about sexuality. Why? Well, the answer is, if you dig down, it's because I want to be selfish with my sexuality. I want to do what I want to do. If I want to have sex with this man, I, nobody can say no. If I want to have sex with this woman, uh, no, nobody can tell me no. If I want to get a transgender operation, nobody can say no. If I want to identify as a kitty cat, then I'm allowed, okay? There's just nobody can say no because uh, nobody can lecture me about sexuality. But yeah, the young people, they want to lecture you and me and everybody else about what's moral when it comes to the, sh the social order and the environment. They're like, oh, you know, you're, you're, destroying, uh, you're destroying the environment. Yeah, okay, whatever. What's wrong with that? Well, it's bad. Well, don't push your morality on me. Who made you? Who, like, you, are you the authority here on what's right and wrong? Um, they say, you know, the one fella, he said that, you know, now I believe in science, okay? Well, let me ask you this. What does science say about what is justice or human dignity? Okay, there's no... Did we do any experiments and figure out what justice is? If you mix sodium and chloride, then look it under the microscope. Oh, there's justice. There it is. It means making sure everybody has universal health care. Okay, I missed that in chemistry class. I didn't see that justice came out of the microscope. Well, it was visible under the microscope with the sodium and the chloride there. Or when we went and sent a probe into space with a Voyager, it didn't bump into justice and say, ah, there it is. We discovered it after all, and it told us exactly what we want to know. So how do the young people know, even know what justice is? Well, merely it's just for them. It's being what they learned on television what they learn on their friends on Twitter or Instagram, uh, what makes them feel good at this very moment, and what gets them applause. Like if you say, well, I think that everybody should get a universal basic income, and they should have universal health care, and my student loans should be uh, set forgiven. forgiven, and I think that 
if you want to get a transgender, that's great. And everybody should clap at me because I'm such a brave person because I do what everybody says and agrees with me. So uh, that's what we're that's what we're that's what we're dealing with. Um, yeah, and I did. I mean, I, I was wondering, like, the perspective of these people because if you're going to lead with social justice, mm -hmm. and if they're not attending, you know, a church service of any kind. Mm -hmm. I'm guessing that they're mostly going to be socialists. So yeah, Karl probably. Marx is basically their lord and savior. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And so how do you get them out of that? Well, uh, there's a couple different ways. But as we go forward, Baron will will outline that. You know, here's another thing is this this often comes up again, the the evolutionist, the scientistic person, the atheist scientistic person um, wants on one hand to tell us that you and me were just like these animals, collections of DNA and chemicals, okay? The earth is not important. We're a pale blue dot somewhere out there in the universe. Just totally irrelevant. You and me, totally irrelevant. And evolution is how we came about. And, you know, we're, we're born out of out of just animal uh, processes, and that's all we'll ever be as animals. Now, okay, well, if you believe that, then you got the question of, well, why should I care about this poor person over there? There, nothing, none of that has anything to do with atheism or evolution or us being insignificant. That's a complete contradiction. Um, if evolution is the survival of the fittest, why should I care about an Indian in the Amazon or uh, a black guy in Africa living in the bush, you know, with a loincloth on. In the evolutionary competition, that guy's a loser. He's a total loser, and I'm the winner because I wear clothes and I drive a car. I am so much more involved with him, okay? And survival of the fittest, he's a waste of resources. Get rid of this guy. Get him out of there. You know, let's do something about it. Uh, does any, I can, let's get smallpox infested blankets and we'll give it to this guy. So him and his tribe, they just die off and then we can go in there and exploit the resources. That's what I learned from evolution. That's what I learned from cosmology where we're not important. We're just animals, man. Relax. Okay. So why, why, what's wrong about that? What's justice? How did you learn what justice is? Um, so this is why I said, just as a preface, I don't believe anything young people say, okay? I don't do it, because they have no clue. They just spout platitudes that they see on TV or what's in the media, what everybody else says, what everybody else thinks. They're sheeple. Maybe if you're lucky, you'll encounter one who, who, uh, will give you an original thought. After you go through all the platitudes, you'll get to the reality. On well, a bunch of people just unsubscribed from this channel. Wonderful. Said what, <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> Goodbye. You ignore you ignore what young people said. Sorry. I'm just saying. <laughs> you don't in absolutes don't ignore what they say, but in um in the relative, understand that they're going to lead with platitudes that come from their peer group. Marxism. Marxism. Okay, and then somewhere in there, if you ask some questions and chip away, you'll get the reality, you know. Before I continue, here's another conflict that I've seen in the news. They're saying, well, we believe in justice or whatever, but yet somehow also we're into evolution, okay. Well, the, again, the atheist cosmologist said, Earth's not important. Uh, we're a pale blue dot. There's all these universes out there, evolutionary processes. There's aliens everywhere. We just haven't seen them. They're far more advanced than us. We're nothing special. Okay, nothing about this Earth. But then we also have the same atheist type who happens to be really interested in global warming. Okay, and then they tell us, we got to do something about climate change. If we don't, we'll destroy this planet. Well, but this guy told me the planet's totally unimportant. And we're an accident and we're not, you know, not a big deal or whatever. So we've, uh, the, the climate changer, the, uh, the, the, the global warming type says we got to do something now, change our behavior. The earth is too important. It's our home. We only have one home. We got to save it. Well, uh, again, 
Um, thank you for the morality lesson, but where is, where is um, the scientific proof that says that we need to do anything about this planet? Because your friend, the atheist cosmologist, told me none of this stuff matters. Now, that is what we're talking about when we're talking about leading with the good, is the reality here is that the youth are correct, that justice is important. The youth are correct that this planet matters, but how, I don't understand how they can reconcile this with this atheistic worldview of the evolution. Uh, they don't. It's just bogus. They only say that stuff because it's an excuse not to believe in the Bible and what the Catholic Church teaches. Again, they want it their way when it comes to sexuality, but they, they, they want to be selfish. But then when it comes to justice, they're greatly interested in sharing other people's resources. Okay? So, now does this work as far as, the, um, as, far as leading with the good? Um, yes, it is. Because if you present the good to someone... And um, as, I, as we've said, and as the philosophers agree with, people are automatically attracted to the good. And so you can use, when the youth are interested in justice, it is a good thing to exploit that to promote the gospel and to evangelize them. Because uh, Christ is the good. He's the way, the truth, and the life. And uh, the, the knowledge of the Trinity and um, union with the Trinity in heaven is the ultimate good. So we just need to, as evangelists, as Catholics, to say, you've got kind of these vague ideas, many of them contradictory, but let's, let's uh, brush away all the dust and dirt there and get to the ultimate good there. And um, that is... That is more or less difficult it depends on the the person that you're dealing with and uh, you know what their interests are so that's my summary of, of what he had to say about the good which takes us into our second point which Bishop Barron says we need to um, evangelize young people by the way of beauty mm -hmm. particularly beautiful artwork so he asks the questions how beautiful how beautiful are our websites? <laughs> how do we as a church engage the great artists of our own time? And how beautiful are our liturgical spaces? So I sort of want to take that one question at a time. Mm -hmm. The first question, how beautiful are our websites? And with that, I want to say, I, th I had this idea where, I don't know if you've seen like Where's Waldo? I hope everyone's familiar with that, <laughs> where you can find Where's Waldo. Well, maybe you can make like a game on a church website where they say, where's the tabernacle? <laughs> and some of them would be actually really hard to find. It would actually be a, a pretty engaging game. So yeah. that was my thought whenever I... I yeah, if how beautiful are our websites. If you're going to try to attract people with your churches, uh, you've totally ruined that because... Most of them, you people, and I mean you, Novus Ordo bishops and priests of the 60s and 70s and 80s, you destroyed them. So you took everything that was nice and you threw it in the trash and said, let's whitewash everything and let's wear burlap sacks and let's get rid of sacred music with the organ and let's sing guitar songs. And that has totally failed, but yet they continue to cling to it because... You have the 60s generation who is leading the church. They're the ones who are in power because they are the most numerous and they're the, they're the old people who, uh, you know, the, the church is run by old people. Look at the cardinals and, and Pope Francis. And these are the guys who were all formed in the 60s and 70s. So they've totally repudiated the artistic tradition of the church. And we know this with, with uh, old people and boomers it's pretty much impossible to get these people to change their minds and change their lives. They have been brainwashed into the loving the ugly and believing in the ugly. And so, so it's going to take another generation to rebuild, to actually add beauty into the church. And unfortunately, you know, there's no money because everybody's left. Um, so where are you going to get the where are you going to get the money to fix your church, which was wrecked by Father Jim Bob in the 70s? And uh, 
And then, you know, there's only 50 people there. Most of them have gray hair. So uh, are, are they going to stick around for this thing? Um, yeah, and this, another question, he said, how do we as a church engage the great artists of our own time? And my thought on that was, I think we really need to be careful asking that because in the Middle Ages, you had Michelangelo, and he was known as a great artist. And I, I think you can appreciate, you know, his skill and what he did for St. Peter's Basilica mm -hmm. and the Sistine Chapel. But I think someone like Andy Warhol comes to mind for me. <laughs> and I'm saying, I think people would consider him a great artist, but would you really want him designing and painting in a church? No. I don't think so. I think we can respect those people, but I think at the same time, we're going to need to engage artists who understand the church's vision of traditional art. Yeah, and that's... Um... You know, those great artists do exist who are interested in uh, decorating churches beautifully, adding artwork, iconography, providing beautiful sacred music. But again, they are often uh, frustrated. I've heard this from many musicians that many of the bishops, I mean, I heard a story about one in particular who didn't want, um, who didn't want organ, and, and maybe maybe the context of what he said was, he didn't want too much organ music, didn't want Gregorian chant, um, because he preferred no music or guitars or whatever, because he thought, well, that will connect with the youth. So again, the 60s, 70s, the pure Novus Ordoist, the Novus Ordoist regime is inimical. They're against the beauty in the liturgy. They want it dumbed down. They want burlap sax and guitar music. And so you've got to, if you start to implement your traditional liturgy, you're going to have a civil war with those people. They are the obstacle, what prevents uh, beautiful liturgies nowadays. Yeah, and just bring up any topic, ad orientum, removing Eucharistic ministers, mm -hmm. only um, boy altar servers. Yeah. And it's, <laughs> it's, like, it's like you just, taught, you know, state, like, Stated blasphemy. Yeah, or something. <laughs> they'd be happier if you blasphemed Christ than you spoke out against uh, a female, a lay extraordinary minister, or a girl altar boy, or whatever. They'll flip. We're putting in an altar rail. They'll flip. You know something. Um, uh, Bishop Barron mentioned was he actually explicitly mentioned Saint John of Damascus, and I watched a really good video uh, about his life that just came out from. Um, I think it was either Trisagion Films, maybe, which is an Eastern Orthodox uh, apostolate on YouTube. It was a great, a great movie about St. John of Damascus. He lived during the uh, one generation after the Muslims conquer conquered the Holy Land. And um, I iconoclasm was a big problem in his day. And he defended the use of icons in churches, in worship, in the liturgy. And... That is something, again, we in our own day have suffered from the iconoclasts who went and destroyed all the statuary of our Catholic tradition. They tore out the paintings. They just painted over all the, the beautiful geometric designs in the churches. Um, they they uh, tore down the old beautiful Gothic altars and tabernacles and they threw up the card table covered by the the colored burlap and again it's absolutely true that we want to present the beautiful to people and it does convert um, as as father mentioned today in his homily and afterwards he celebrated a nuptial mass a solemn high nuptial mass yesterday. That's and, a Latin mass. Yes. And many young people came to him after the mass was over. This was friends, the bride and the groom. And they said, that was the most beautiful thing ever. You know, uh, wow, I don't know what to think. I had no idea what was going on, but it was just tremendous. And that, okay, from the mouth of the young people is we resonate with this beauty. And so... That is something to lead with. This is the position of the importance of the Latin Mass in evangelization. Yeah, and, and uh, Archbishop Sample also mentioned that in his comment. He didn't specifically mention the Latin Mass, but he said, you know, young people really appreciate beautiful liturgies. Yeah. I think, you know, look at where the young people are at. 
It's the Latin Mass. Mm -hmm. So I think that has a direct connection. And Bishop Barron, in a question after, you know, in the press conference, he did kind of dismiss the Latin Mass as a means of evangelization. He said, I think you can do the Novus Ordo beautifully. And I was like, well, that is not the question. <laughs> like, yeah. the question is, the question was about the Latin Mass, and yeah, you can do the Novus Ordo beautifully, but is it being done beautifully? Nobody, very few people do it beautifully. Um, and the reason for that is because the, one, of the points of the, one of the points of the new Mass was to get rid of the mystery, to get rid of Latin. Let's make everything totally understandable. Let's translate it into not only just English, but sixth grade English, so that the lowest common denominator of children... Um, or the least educated man who works in a steel mill can understand this liturgy entirely. Let's remove any kind of symbolism or repetition. Let's get rid of repeated uh, prayers. Let's not have anything secretly prayed at Mass. Why? Why are you keeping things secret from us? Let's say everything out loud. Active participation. Yeah, let's say everything with the priest. Let me get communion in the hand. Oh, even better, let my uh, grandma distribute Holy Communion because, uh, I, you know, why? I don't know, but, but the, the new Mass, the people who concocted the new Mass wanted to get rid of the mystery, the transcendent, and the beauty. For whatever reason, they thought that those were obstacles to people embracing the faith. Well, how is that working out for you? Because now we're 60 years into the Novus Ordo, and it's not, or is it 50? So 1969. 50 to 60 because they started it. Yeah, yeah. so 69 yeah. to 2019. Um, we've, we've had that for 50 years, and nobody, the young people are not interested in the banal, mundane, everyday, no mystery, no transcendent, no beauty, no visordo. Now, it's true. There, is, there are unicorn no visordos out there. And what are, they, what are they like? Well, they're like the Latin Mass. They're like the old missal, okay? Um, it's the new missal celebrated as if it was the old missal. Well, what good does that do when we can just say the old missal, especially since the prayers are so much better? And a lot of it, it, it remains, even if you say the new missal in Latin, many of the rubrics were suppressed that, that, that represented this mystery, this transcendence, this beauty, this repetition that we don't understand. And that's the whole point, is it teaches you, you don't understand the liturgy because you're not capable of, and you won't understand the liturgy until you get to heaven. If you understand it here, then it's not a divine origin. And it's just of the world. And so then there's nothing to really cling on to and to meditate upon. If you remove that mystery, then you've removed, you've turned it into 2 plus 2 equals 4. You've turned it into the latest episode of Game of Thrones or the latest movie. And it's no longer gripping to your soul long term every Sunday for the rest of your life. Ready to move on to the next point? Yeah. All right. The point number three is stop dumbing down the faith. And I, I'm actually going to take this a step further. Oh, yeah. John the Son of Thunder, I'm going to say stop preaching false theology. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> now, in this section, Bishop Barron, he referenced von Balthasar several times, and it's like, we need to stop pretending that the Catholic Church was founded in 1962. <laughs> By von, ba von Balthasar, one of the founders, along with de Lubach. De Lubach and he mentioned uh, all of these modernist theologians, yeah. and I'm like, and you did, you, you um, referenced, I don't know if it was the only saint he referenced, the only person that came before 1962, <laughs> but... It, it was kind of awkward because I'm like, okay, well, you're, you're talking about only Vatican II whenever we yeah. have 1,900 more years mm -hmm. of church history before that. Yeah, when he says we've got two generations of Catholics that have a poor intellectual formation, look no further than that. You've thrown everybody away because we can't talk about them. Why? Oh, they're pre-Vatican II or whatever. Well, the reason why is because it's by design. If you go and read that, if you read those Catholic authors then you'll realize what you're seeing and hearing at Mass on Sunday and what comes out of the mouth of these USCC bishops is not the same religion, 
okay? They have formed a new religion which is completely cut off from the past. So I don't see how he's going to keep the new Novus Ordoist religion, how he will keep that in trying to get people grounded in, an, in, in the intellectual past of the church. The young people are going to see the trick, which is what happened to me and many other people who attend this tremendous Latin Mass here, is they come to this Mass, they begin to read more, and they're like, oh, wow, there's all this depth. How come nobody told me any of this stuff? Uh, good question. Maybe that was by design. <laughs> Maybe they don't want you to know. Okay? Well, I mean, when people start asking questions, whenever they find out the answers are inadequate, yeah, then they start asking more questions, mm -hmm. and then it does lead them to the Latin Mass, and... It's really inconvenient and it's really uncomfortable. <laughs> and there's no, the bad the bad guys have no answer. Bishop Barron says that basically we're living in a pastoral disaster now. Young people have so many unanswered questions, and no, very few people in the church can give them answers. Well, and would you want them to well, give them answers? <laughs> uh, most of these people know, and they're they're not even able to provide, and that's why people are going on YouTube, and people are watching Taylor Marshall. People are watching Timothy Gordon. People are showing up to the Latin Mass. People are watching E. Michael Jones. Because these guys pr give you the answers that have existed in the intellectual mind of the church for thousands of years. Um, here's something interesting. B uh, Bishop Barron said young people use the lingo of the new atheists. So we have... we. It's true that they talk about... Um, they talk about rights, God can't exist because we have this problem of evil, and so these people, the, 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 the salient point here is that the young people don't even speak the language of the church. And why is that? Well, I'll get to that a little bit, a little bit later here, but, uh, did you, I thought it was interesting that Barron, um, Bishop Barron said he went on to Reddit. And did yeah. he ask me a question and had the second biggest participation of any of these ask me a questions? He got 15,000 questions, and most of which could be summarized in who is God? How do you know that there is a God? Doesn't science prove that there is no God? What about the problem of evil? Why did my brother die? Why did my cat die? Why did I fail that test? How do you know that your religion is the true one? Um... What about uh, homosexuals and transgendered people? What are we going to do with them? And so these are the things that are interesting, and the church has the answers. If you, as a, you know, the person outside the church, the unbaptized, the dissenting Catholic, the heretical Catholic, you might not like the answers, but we have the answers, just like you might not want to, um, you know, have to, to give up uh, whatever pleasure you might have in your life, but if you want to be happy and conform yourself to the truth, you have to listen to what the church says. He then, he then finishes up and says, again, he says, we have the answers. He offered as an example from the gospel a really good one where you have the disciples on the road to Emmaus. And they're just walking around and they're asking questions and they encounter Christ who they don't recognize. And they have a dialogue, and he says, asks them, uh, what are you talking about? And they say, oh, about Jesus of Nazareth. We thought he was a great prophet, but they, he was rejected by the people, and they killed him. And now he said he was going to rise on the third day, and then some of our friends said they saw him. And then Christ listens to this, and then he teaches them all about himself and the prophecies of the Old Testament. And then at the end... They say, hey, let's gear up, grab a bite to eat or whatever. And so he does the breaking of the bread, which is the Eucharist, and they recognize him. And so their hearts were opened. And then they say, hey, weren't our hearts burning when we were talking with him on the road? And Bishop Barron rightly says that this is, this is a, a, a method of us where we as Catholics, or you, you know, the bishops and the priests, they do this listening and then they say, Christ is the answer to this, Christ is the answer to this, Christ is the answer to this. This is something that the Marxists do very well. And they did this in the Soviet Union, did this in communist Poland, 
is they'll have these seminars or whatever, and they'll go and they'll say, oh, we have these terrible problems in society and all this. Uh, how do we fix these? Well, here's what our prophet Mark says. And so now, blah, 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 this will solve this. Which, who wants to get saved? Come up here and accept Mark's as your Lord and personal <laughs> Savior. We'll give you a, a card. You'll be a card-carrying member of the Communist Party. You've evolved, and you're a great person. You're the future of the world. Well, our bishops, our priests, and our masses, maybe not our mass per se, but at our Catholic colleges, we should be going through these are the problems in the world well what's the solution this is what the church teaches us from the scripture from the tradition and get everybody fired up and say you know do you believe you believe then give your life to christ okay start discerning a call to religious life the priesthood start praying the rosary start re doing spiritual reading doing mental prayer um Think about these things. Change your life. This is an opportunity that we're wasting because everybody's tuned out. Go to Mass on Sundays. Receive communion, okay, in the hand. Uh, go home. Watch football. Watch the Steelers. Sunday night, whatever shows are on. Oh, I go talk to my friends on, on Twitter or on Instagram or on Facebook. And the church has not taught you anything. Your catechesis is weak. It's watered down, and the big questions have not been asked and answered. Um, and sadly, Bishop Barron, so far, on these three points, uh, has, has well, he's made excellent points. So this is the truth. The good, the beautiful, and the true are uh, very important. They're the three transcendentals. They are, um, they're very important in evangelization. Let's move on to number four. Um, now, I noticed that some of these points started blending together. There's only five, mm -hmm. but they sort of blended yeah. together. Number four is turn every parish into a mission society. So encourage priests and laity to evangelize. Mm -hmm. Now he references the new evangelization. And like I said, it's like the church didn't exist before Vatican II. <laughs> well, yeah. He he posts or he he stated a quote. I think it was from Pope John the Twenty Third that said, "Knock down the walls behind which the church was crouching," and that kind of bothered me a little bit because I was thinking like you, you reference beauty, but then you're referencing knocking down the walls behind. Like, Just so but, the pigs can come in and destroy the vineyard. And, well, well, you know, is well, that what we're after? More importantly, I was like, there were beautiful paintings on the walls. <laughs> you so, knocked out. So you knocked them down and just painted over them with white paint. Yeah. And so now you're, you're I, I don't know, I, I feel like you're kind of fighting an uphill battle at that point. But, and, and then there was another quote here where he said, the young people aren't going to come to us typically. And I said, wrong. Yeah, I you should be. come to the Latin Mass. Yeah, people just show up every <laughs> Sunday. It's like, oh, who are you? Well, you know, I've been seeing this, and a friend brought me, and then all of a sudden, you've got a, you've got a fish on the hook. And they begin... See, this is what's interesting, is I thought about our tiny little community here, our Latin Mass. This is a missionary society, exactly. because several times here... Okay, so we have some people who attend the new Mass who just show up. And they're like, oh, I wanted to see this. Or a friend invited me. What did you think? It was unbelievable. I've never seen anything like that before. It was so beautiful. I had no idea what was going on. A number of times we've had friends bring uh, Protestant friends. Uh, one time in the choir here, there was a girl who um, was a friend of a friend. And she sang a mass with us. And she was a... Baptist or something, and she said, oh yeah, this was the first Mass I've ever been to. New, old, whatever. Awesome. First Catholic <laughs> Mass. And uh, uh, somebody asked her, I don't remember, it was me, your father said, uh, oh, what did you think? She said, it was really neat, very beautiful. Uh, interesting. I have questions and I'd like to know more. So, so what you see is when somebody shows up to the Latin Mass, immediately they begin to ask questions. Why do you do this? Why do you do that? Why is this different? What do you believe if you're a Protestant? What do you believe? So these questions begin to happen, and then by the there's very good Catholics that go to Latin masses. I mean, you're going to find some very smart people that are well-read, 
that live a holy life, either in, in religious life or in a lay life as married. They're the people that have uh, 10 kids and they're homeschooling and they're praying the rosary and all this stuff. And these people have done their reading. They know the answers to these questions. So the perfect example of this missionary society is your Latin Mass parish that's in your town. Really, probably 90, 95% of them are missionary societies where you can show up as a disaffiliated, disaffected young, disaffected young person and have many questions answered, meet many good friends, see the good, the true, the beautiful, uh, be in touch with the intellectual formation, the intellectual heritage of the church um, through the liturgy. Another thing that I, I didn't particularly like about what, what Bishop Barron said and, and how he quoted John the 23rd was, well, wait a minute, let's look at some of these great um, evangelists from the past. Von Balthasar. Uh, let's, I don't want to talk about Von Balthasar. He's never evangelized anybody. Let's look at somebody, people who are actually canonized and people have a devotion to. Oh, but Von, I heard some people, uh, apparently on the podcast, they said Von Balthasar should be canonized as saint. And then we're going back <laughs> to number three, thumbing down the faith. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and I was like, oh, okay, watch, do you watch Taylor Marshall's episode on Von Balthasar? <laughs> like, you need to check that out. You don't yeah. need, Von Balthasar is just confusing and wordy. If you want to know, let's talk about the saints the saints who who I give as examples of saints who lived the faith authentically, didn't tear down walls, didn't go out there and grab people and say, Hey, come, this is really cool. We're gonna <laughs> we're gonna smoke cigarettes and do beat poetry and then we're gonna have a Eucharist and it's just like uh, you hold hands hold and sing hands, kumbaya. kumbaya guitars. Okay, let's look here. Saint Benedict St. Francis, the Desert Fathers, all right? So these are guys, St. Benedict, who just decided, I'm going to go live in a cave. The world's terrible. I'm going to go pray and save my soul because it's just bad. St. Francis, the world's a terrible place. I'm just going to go and live in this run-down church, live in this cave, Start, God gives me, says rebuild my church, so I'm going to go over here with some brick and mortar and kind of rebuild this. Is that St. Francis of Assisi? Assisi, yeah. Yeah, and he's actually misinterpreted. Of course, the Pope took the name Francis, mm -hmm. and people said, oh, well, he was all about social justice, and he talked to animals, and he wrote <laughs> poetry about the, you know, brother, son, sister, moon, something like yeah. that. And no, he he was, he's very misinterpreted, mm -hmm. and Actually, there was a book, I heard about a book that was written about him where it clarifies those things, and I'll have to maybe post that down below. But Yeah, he was in some ways like St. Benedict, just a guy who decided, I'm going to go out here and live in a cave. Oh, and then here's a poor person, let me give him, uh, I'll give him my cloak, and maybe I can go collect some stuff and, and give it to these poor people or whatever. And the um, preach the gospel always quote, preach the gospel always by necessary use words, that's mm -hmm. attributed to him, but it actually is, uh, I guess, sort of, uh, it's not a, tr a real quote, but it's sort of twisted from whenever he was talking to the brothers in the order, not the priests, but the brothers. Yeah. And he, he basically said, like, the brothers shouldn't speak at Mass whenever the priest is speaking. Yeah. That's, I mean... <laughs> St. Francis was not a... Came down get this. St. Francis, not a priest. St. Benedict, not a priest. The Desert Fathers, do we even know if they were a priest? It didn't, it doesn't really matter. They lived in caves. These are another people. Uh, the Desert Fathers just went into a cave in the wilderness. They prayed. They did fasting. Now, then what happened? Did they just die in this cave and that was the end of them? No. I mean, if you're out there living a holy life, people will show up. They'll just bump into you and say, Oh, wow, there's a really holy guy. Teach me something. Let me live like you do. Teach us how to pray, how to fast. So, very quickly, St. Benedict, St. Francis, the Desert Fathers, like St. Anthony of the Desert, they've got all these disciples. Did they knock down any walls? No. They just went into a cave and prayed. Did they go out and do street corner evangelization with guitars? Did they? You're speak, going to hell. Did they speak in so-called <laughs> tongues and do a charismatic revival? No, they just went into a cave and prayed. And so I think it's, I think it's, um, 
it's selling the tradition of the church short to say to kind of overlook these guys who just decided to pray and do fasting and uh, the, the, they weren't part of the evangelization of the world because they were. St. Benedict and St. Francis are two of the greatest saints in the Latin church and they, they just lived the faith authentically and people came to them. They didn't even have to try. So the fifth point is the creative use of media, particularly social media. And I'm just going to throw a few of his quotes out there. Mm -hmm. Bishop Barron said, I think we should invest a lot of time and money in getting really good people to work our social media. And he also said some, some parishes should send someone for doctoral studies in order to run social media. I don't like, what do you need studies? a PhD to run well, a, a Facebook or a Twitter? I think, I don't know if he meant sending, sending them for doctoral studies in theology so that they could. No, well, he said, talk not, about he said, media he said rather send than them. sending your priest for an advanced degree in theology, send them for communications. communications? Oh, wow. To run a Twitter or yeah, Facebook. And, yeah, I, I'm, I was definitely uh, not in agreement with that 100%. Um, I, I don't know if, because. You know, I guess that comes with the idea of meeting people where they're at, but social media is eventually going to fade away, like just like any fad. Mm -hmm. So, I, and I think right now that might be an effective means of evangelization. Maybe, I mean, not maybe, really. Maybe, maybe yeah. I mean, may, it might be, it's an effective way of spreading the word, we'll just say, but maybe not evangelization. I mean, you can reach more people on social yeah. media, and I think that's what he's getting at. Is it a real encounter, though? I want to make a distinction between, well, there's various kinds of social media. So, YouTube is a tool that I actually believe in, because it's a way to, to get voices out there, good voices that you would not have heard. As uh, Robert has mentioned, the, the media is completely controlled. You've got one voice. The bad guys are completely in charge. If you venture off what's acceptable for the media guys, then you're off TV. So forget about TV. Forget about Time Magazine and Life Magazine. Total waste of time. But with YouTube, you can get ideas out there. Um, even now with self-publishing, if you want to write a book, you can get it listed on Amazon.com. So I'm going to make a distinction with YouTube, which I think is a good medium. And then there's other, like the worst of all mediums, me, the worst of all media is Twitter. Twitter. <laughs> Twitter is pure evil because who is on Twitter? Well, I don't know. It's a bunch of fake names, a bunch of NPCs, a bunch of bots who are there to generate just traffic. And if you post something, let's say, I don't know, you're Trump or whatever, and you post something, it's like there's a bot that, that, that watches Trump. And as soon as he posts something, a half of a second later, it's spammed with 10 anti-Trump bots who are like, Oh, you're evil. Orange man, bad. Resign. We'll impeach you. Ha ha ha. You're the stupidest person ever, orange man. And so, the parody accounts, too. Parody accounts. <laughs> Season of the parish council. <laughs> memes. I mean, Twitter. Uh, Father uh, Bishop Barron did say, I don't know if this came about on uh, Twitter or Facebook or YouTube, but he did tell a story about a, that he had done a video where he, as a priest, just talked about Bob Dylan and how he liked him. And there was a guy who hated priests, and he happened to just watch the Bob Dylan video. So then he watched other videos and said, oh, maybe priests aren't that evil after all. And he enjoyed these videos, and he ended up converting. So whatever that was, if you're engaged on Twitter... By the way, let's talk about Facebook. I think Facebook is somewhere in between YouTube or and Twitter. Because on Facebook, everybody has a real name. So if you see John Smith said insulted you, then you know John Smith's a wacko. I'm just going to defriend John Smith. <laughs> or you can block him. Block or him. And like, why are you friends? Who, who is John Smith? Why do I care about him if I've never met him in real life? So the bottom line is people act normally when you know who they are. Ah, uh, usually. Usually, I mean, for instance, <laughs> if you're walking down the street, um, yeah, rarely will yeah. somebody like punch you or call you a name. But if you're behind the wheel of a car, people will flip you off. They'll get road raged, which is something they'd never do if you were standing beside each other in uh, like the, the grocery store. Now, maybe if you're at a Popeyes, 
you'll get you'll get into a brawl about who is first in line. Okay, so Popeyes is kind of like Twitter, but Facebook, you know, is, is a little bit better. But I think YouTube is probably the best because, you know, in the comments, it's more people talking about the videos. There's no personal attacks. Um, so what I, what I wanted to say about the media is, you know, the way to use the media, the way to use the Facebook, the way to use the Twitter is throw something up there and then leave. Uh, don't bother engaging because, as Bishop Barron said, there's so many trolls and people posting obscene responses. Just don't feed the trolls. Don't engage. The real people who are authentically interested, when you put up your good content, they'll be attracted and they'll follow you again. And if they really want a question and answer, they'll email you, they'll show up in person. Here's where I want to give a mm -hmm. shout out to my subscribers. Uh, uh, the all, you, all, you guys always post positive comments and I really appreciate that. So yeah. that's, that's a thumbs up. Again, this is a good channel because you have real people who are watching this channel. We're not big enough to have trolls and people who just watch to hate. You know, who will just do some trolls. instant thumbs down, you know. <laughs> so nobody is watching us uh, unless they're genuinely interested or it just happens to pop up because are intent on trolling, well, which, which is the case in the Amazon Senate. Okay, so, you, so there was trolls There were a few Amazon trolls in the Senate. Amazon Senate. Okay. I do want to actually um, second your, your you know, statement about YouTube. Yeah. And if you look in real time at... Um, you know, priests who have posted videos like Father John Hollowell posts some homilies on yeah. YouTube, and you can see that, and that's like a good way to engage anyone really of any age. And also, Father Mark Goring is one of my favorites. Yeah, he's good. To see on YouTube, and the, you know, if if you see more priests posting on YouTube, I think there might be you know a more positive response, especially for the priests that are teaching sound theology, and you know, like those two I mentioned, they have a really strong subscriber base, and. A lot of people give them really positive feedback and say like you know your videos have inspired me and yeah it's 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 clear teaching and it's basically like what's Bishop Barron's five points are you know going down through some of them at the very least yeah you you're engaging people you're showing the good the true the beautiful you are being a missionary and you're using the new media so the priests and the parishes that do have this good social media and use it properly do tremendous. I mean, I think of so much that I've learned from watching YouTubes and the, the new ideas that I've thought of, and I've kind of I've brought those here into the parish and into my friend group. We've discussed these things. We've had meetings about them. Um, and in the old days, this stuff never would have been talked about. You know, for instance, at the homily today, Father mentioned about um, how come nobody got upset in 1986 about the Assisi fiasco. Well, I said to him, well, the reason why is there was no internet. Nobody knew anything about Assisi unless you subscribe to the Remnant, Catholic Family News, maybe the Wanderer, maybe the Angelus, CC, no, no, some traditionalist paper. Okay, everybody else was just like, Psst. They didn't want anybody to know about a CC. But nowadays, if somebody in the Vatican bows down to a Pachamama, it's all over the internet, life site, and they're going to talk about it. So the bad guys can't hide their apostasy and their heresy. It's there for people to see. Again, that's a tremendous thing about social media is people in real time are seeing this stuff, and they can call it out. And it's not easy to sweep it under the rug. All right. Any closing thoughts? No, I mean, I, well, yeah, I would say that, that Bishop Barron makes some tremendous points. You have, to, you have to filter it through, understand where he's coming from, who his audience is. Remember, they're USCCB, they're Novus Ordo bishops, they're formed in the Novus Ordo. Um, they're going to want to, they're, they're gonna want to uh, avoid the, the Latin Mass question. Um, that's a question that they don't want to bring up because it puts in danger the entire Novus Ordo paradigm. It puts in, in danger the entire pontificate of the post-conciliar popes. It, it leads to questions about what they were doing. But if you take, if you listen to what he says, and then you filter it through Catholic tradition, then there's some excellent things there. And the thing, of, again, that I find ironic about the whole process is who is most effectively using these five paths. It's actually the traditionalists, okay? The people who attend the Latin Mass, 
the people who, uh, the priests who belong to Latin mass societies, those even who are in, in the Novus Ordo, um, who are Catholic, you know, they attend the new mass or they celebrate the new mass, but they believe the church and, and they're connected to the history, the tradition of the church, the intellectual tradition, the history of the church. Those guys are the ones who have the impact. Um, and I just find that ironic um, is that the most of the, the Novus Ordo bishops, they just, um, they're not there with a media presence. They're not there with a physical presence. And, um, and, and Bishop Barron's talking to them, but um, it's actually the laity, it's actually the lay people and a small number of traditionalist priests who are effectively doing this evangelization. All right, well, this has been the Thunder and Lightning Show with John the Son of Thunder and Ryan the Retrograde. Thank you so much for watching, and go make a difference. <laughs> Thank you.